When it comes to the best jobs of today and tomorrow, can we do better by thinking more creatively, like the industrial and agricultural ages of the past? My next guest says we are looking at the greatest opportunity lying in a creative age. Richard Florida is the professor at the University of Toronto and the author of The Rise of the Creative Class, revised now from its original edition. Richard, it's great to have you on the program. It's great to be back, Maria. Good to see you again. So we're four or five years into a sustained financial crisis, uh, persistently high unemployment. These are issues we're talking about all the time. You said an interesting thing in your book. The longer the crisis goes on, the smaller the ideas get for fixing it. Tell me about your, your big idea on this, the well, transformation in terms of classes of workers. Well, it's interesting. You know, people are talking about either bringing back manufacturing jobs. We are going to bring back some, a couple hundred thousand, a million, or they're saying educate people for the newer jobs. Now, those new jobs, the professional jobs, management jobs, knowledge jobs, arts and creative jobs, they're growing at a good pace. Unemployment's been low, under 5% if you have one of those jobs. If you have a BA, bachelor's degree and above, under 5% for you. And you're going to grow about 7 million of those. But we have 60 plus million Americans today, 45% of our workforce doing the low wage service jobs. The people who prepare our food, take care of our aging parents, our kids, wait on us in shops, retail clerks. And those jobs pay 25 grand, 30 grand, they're not secure jobs. So what I argue in the book and what I've been talking about across the country is we've got to make those jobs, those low-wage service jobs, we've got to somehow boost them up and make them better jobs. Well, if we're relying so much on service jobs, how do we make them better paid and, and better jobs? Well, we did it before in manufacturing, and this is what, what surprises me how we forget and go back to these small solutions. My father, born in the 20s, got a job in a factory in 1934 in North New Jersey, not far from here where we are today. He said when he, it took nine people to make a family wage when he started that job. He came back from World War II. He served, stormed the beaches at Normandy. He said, I, as if by magic, Richard, I had a good job. I could buy a home, get married, put you two boys through college. We decided we could pay a little more. We could improve our productivity in the factories. That's what we have to do with services. And you know what? When you look at the best service companies, now I've done this. I've looked at Zappos and others, but there's a great study published in the Harvard Business Review. When you look at the top retail companies, if they engage their workers, they boost their salary, you know what? They get better customer service, they get higher productivity. But well, it's the same thing, the same way you build a better factory, by engaging workers, you can build a better service job, and it's a win-win for the worker, it's a win-win for the company. Where, where is the innovation? Who's innovating when it comes to service jobs and, and, and blending them with creative jobs? Where are the bright well, spots? Well, I, I think if you look at the, the annual lists of the best employers, you get the high-tech companies, but you also get companies bubbling up like the Container Store or Whole Foods, my good friend Tony Shea's company, Zappos. I think they're an incredible innovative. You know, you buy your shoes online and they send them to you. But they've developed a model of engaging the workers in their jobs, engaging them, you know, tapping their intelligence, and they can become a source of better customer service and problem solving. Just like in a factory, when you want to solve a problem, you get the workers together, they form a quality circle, they engage in continuous improvement. That's what they, the other thing that's really interesting about Zappos, now this can't happen everywhere. They're in Las Vegas, they're moving out of the suburbs, back to the downtown, and they're taking over the city hall, the old city hall, but they're buying up old condos, and they're creating more affordable housing, so they can pay their workers better, give them an opportunity to move up from within, but now they can get a little bit more affordable housing, so they're tackling that on two ends, but that's what the best service companies are doing. Interesting. Where do your students, I mean, it goes back to education, right? Where do your students want to live? Where do they want to work? Well, this is a big shift that I talk about in the book, and I, and I talked about it 10 years ago, but it has shocked me what's happened over the past decade. Young people in the tech fields who used to be going to the suburban office park in the Silicon, now, Silicon Valley is still a great place, but more and more young people want to be in big cities like New York, or, or even if they want to go in tech in the West Coast, they go to San Francisco. And when I ask kids, I say, you know, what if you wanted to go to a suburb and you get a good job and you buy a house and it's affordable? No. I'll take a smaller space in a dynamic city. So one of the things we're seeing, which I think is not only the reinvention of cities, that's been going on for a while, but high tech. I think it's really interesting because for a long time it was all about Silicon Valley in terms of entrepreneurialism and startup activity. Now you're seeing this happen in Brooklyn. You're seeing this happen really across the country. Yeah, Silicon really interesting. Valley still, you know, and it's still the number one place for startup companies. But number two is New York, you know, take great? Manhattan and Brooklyn, it's the number two place, and again, you know, Twitter put its headquarters in San Francisco. So I think you see this new shift. What I like about this 
is it, it offers up the city as a place not only to solve technical problems, not only to invent new software, but to create new business models. And maybe, you know, when you have an interesting guy like a mayor, like Mayor Bloomberg, or, or in Chicago, a very good problem solver like Rahm Emanuel, you could actually see this combination of technology, social media, solving big urban problems. And to me, that seems like a, a big step ahead for our country. I agree with you. It's a great story. Richard, good to have you on the program. Oh, it's great. Thanks for having me back. Hope to see you again soon. You too. Richard Florida joining us.